booktube welcome back to the history show this is peg uh today or this evening i should say it is a sunday early evening and uh we have new releases we have mailbox delivery we have books falling out of my ears out of the corner of your eye. yes out of my ears um wow I've gotten some really cool stuff in the mail, you guys, and I know you love to see new books. So that's what this uh, video is about. First off, though, I want to say, uh, got some good news. I'm going to start off with the good news. Uh, Thursday, the 25th, I will no longer be on the market. Cr crickets. <laughs> Crickets. Is this something you should be aware of? Should be aware of? Um, uh, no. Thursday morning. Um, so Martine and I are going to get married. Yay! Going down to the courthouse. Uh, so it's exciting. I just wanted to share that. Uh, we both did. Just with our friends out there. We know you guys are all just also awesome. And it's it's our happy news. It's our good news. And of course, I'll probably be talking about it throughout the week. <laughs> And I can't believe this. Everything be able to be done in person now. That's right. No. It's going to be a beautiful, uh, well, I mean, it's we plan on having a big get-together and throwing a big shindig, hopefully in the summer when we'll see how things go with the, um, the COVID restrictions. We'd like to have our new home set up by then in the summer, maybe late summer, early fall. I keep pushing it out <laughs> um, to have a big, you know, kind of a, a get-together. But right now we want to make it official um, and just go get our marriage license. So that will be um, Thursday. Yay. February. Yes. Yay. February 25th will be our date. Yay. Okay. Yay. So with that good news, uh, I just have to say I have been so touched lately. One of the beautiful things about having this booktube, BookTube channel, and I've had it for more than a year now, uh... Gosh, a year and a half, right, hun? I think maybe started it in September of not last year, the year before. So yeah, almost a year and a half has been the people I have met, um, other readers, other um, history lovers, um, historians, writers, authors. Uh, I've just uh, working with you know editors and publicists and. Uh, it's just been amazing. I've just had so much fun. Um, well, the thing that has touched me probably the most are the people who have reached out to me with their own works and said, hey, you know, you love history. And, you know, we know that you are really, you know, especially into like uh, history of the armed forces, you know, and uh, would you be willing to take a look at this book? And, you know, it. I can say it really started with uh, – my, uh, you know, association with uh, Colonel Nightingale, um, you know, reading his memoirs of, of uh, Vietnam and and then kind of just branching out and just hearing from other people who have reached out to me, and like, like recently with the 77 Letters by Susan P. Hunter. Um, she reached out to me, and I've just started reading this one, and uh, I can tell right now it's just, it's a page turner. And I, I love it. I, I just love these type of, of stories that really bring home um, what it was like to be uh, both a soldier at war and then a civilian back home, and then the two the two conversing and, and sharing uh, support for each other. And um, anyway, it's just been amazing. And I'll report back as I get further into the book on seventy seven letters. But through through Susan Hunter. Um, she knew of someone else and encouraged them to reach out to me. And I just, I really want to thank them. Um, this is a book about a woman. Uh, her name um, is Agnes Joan Negra. And this is all about her story. And it was written by um, uh, her son. It was written by Ronald Edward Negra. Um, based on the memories of Agnes Joan Negra. And this is called Waves of Hope. They just sent this to me. Um, 
and it's a fascinating story. They sent me a very nice letter and also uh, two pictures of the woman that this is about who just turned 101. Uh, I'm just, uh, look at her. She's holding the book up. That's fantastic. So what's going on with this, with this book, Waves of Hope, is, uh, and there's a great picture on the back. And I'll, I'll read the blurb here. Um, but Ronald uh, Edward Nagara's book, Waves of Hope, um, is about his mother, who, who recently turned 101 uh, on uh, November 13th. So happy belated birthday, Agnes. Um, it tells of her adventures during World War II. Sorry for the glare, everybody. Uh, listening to her shortwave radio from Nutley, New Jersey, each day uh, to Radio Berlin to hear names of American POWs, prisoners of war, uh, that were announced. She then wrote letters to their family to let them know their loved one was still alive. All the POW family letters written back to her are included in the book, and Agnes's story is woven throughout the text. Um, so they even autographed the book, and it, it, it's just wonderful. Um, you, we actually have, like, scanned... Let me put that up here. Scanned images of the letters. Um, but what a service uh, Mrs. Negra did, um, writing to families of POWs to tell them that they were alive. Um, and then the, the quote on the back here is... Um, it's just, it's just beautiful. And I want to say thank you to Ronald Negra for um, inscribing it. To Peggy, always keep hope in, in, uh, in your heart. And isn't that true? Um, but uh, this is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Um, this is a, a, let me just read the foreword to you a little bit. This is a, the foreword was, writ was written by Agnes. Um, this story is my diary of the compassions, emotions, and heart-wrenching turmoil affecting American families during World War II. Little did I know at the time I would play a role during the war that would bring some of the families who didn't know the fate of their relatives missing in action a sense of hope and faith that they may see their loved ones again. At age 100, my memories of the war years are as vivid as they were 78 years ago when our country went to war with the Axis powers. I have many specific recollections of those years, especially watching my husband leave for military service in Europe and how I received information after he was wounded on the battlefield at the Battle of the Bulge. There are other experiences that brought tears to my eyes during the war when the mailman came to my door. I received letters of hope from prisoner of war family members acknowledging the communications I sent them regarding the status of their husbands, sons, fathers, and brothers. Those personal memories have been kept in a box since the war ended in 1945. They are memories of American airmen that became prisoners of war when their airplanes were shot down over Nazi-occupied countries. This is the story of the contents of those postcards and letters and what I did to bring comfort to the families of loved ones who fought and sacrificed their lives in distant lands for our country. It is my hope you will share my emotions reading the words expressed by their family members who lived every day of the war wondering if their loved ones were alive, while being grateful to receive word, any word, about the fate of their men. And that was written by Agnes Joe Negra on uh, November 13th. 20, 20, it is, isn't that awesome? How do you, how do you beat that? You, you don't beat that. And, and the beginning of the book uh, is a quote from a mother of a prisoner of war uh, writing to, to Agnes, and she said, as long as there are Americans like you, who are doing such wonderful work and giving such wonderful service to our fellow Americans. I'm sure victory will be ours, and you can be sure you and others like you have played a vital part. So I just want to thank you. I'm sending a thanks to uh, uh, Ronald um, uh, and Val, Val Negra, who sent me the email. And uh, uh, just thank you so much, and thank you, Agnes. Thank you for your service to our country. Um, I'm just going to show your picture because I love it. This is fantastic. And again, happy belated 100 and birthday. one first birthday. Yes, from Martina and myself. Uh, I also have a bookmark. But, um, oh, yes, I've read a few of these letters already, and uh, it's 
you know, if that doesn't tug at your heartstrings and just make you really realize what's uh, what's important in life, I don't, I know, I don't know what will, but this is um, a wonderful, wonderful gift. Uh, and thank you so much for sending me. And so everyone out there, I really encourage you to check out this book. You can find it on um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's written by Ronald Edward, Edward uh, Negra, um, Waves of Hope. So thank you so much. So that has been just, has brought a, a smile to my face, you know, when I go to the mailbox and I find something like this. It's just wonderful. And then another, <laughs> another historian uh, and author who has written several books, uh, we've become uh, friends through Instagram. Um, and this, that is a retired major, Peter Belmonte, uh, or Belmonte. I, Peter, let me know if I mispronounced that. I apologize. But, um, Peter, just say yes and don't tell her how. <laughs> she said, Peter, just say yes, but don't say how. She likes to torture me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, I have this to look forward to yeah. for the rest of my days. All right, so uh, <laughs> um, so we connected through Instagram, and I found out he was a uh, he, he's written several books, um, and he told me about one he'd recently finished writing and or was, had finished, and I was really intrigued. And he said, "I'd be happy to send you a copy," and I said, "I'd be happy to take a look at it." Um, and this is called "The Roaring Lion," Father Leo Rizzo. A, a Calabrian, Calabrian priest in the American Civil War by Peter L. Bel Belmonte, or Belmonte. Let me know, Peter. <laughs> I'm going to make sure Let's I get it right no. for next time. No. And there's Peter on the back there. Uh, let me give you a quick rundown on this. This Gennaro, or Leo, Rizzo was one of the earliest immigrants from Calabria, Italy, to the United States. Arriving in 1860, the Franciscan priest worked in Pennsylvania and Connecticut uh, before joining the 9th Connecticut Infantry Regiment as their chaplain in 1864. This was an Irish regiment, and Father Leo had learned English from Irish priests. He spoke English with an Irish brogue. <laughs> uh, how interesting. How, after his discharge, Father Leo served as pastor of St. Joseph Church in Winstead, Connecticut from 1865 until his death in 1897. He had only two brief hiatuses, 1870 and 1871, and again from 1877 until 1880, when he served as president of St. Bonaventure College and Seminary in New York. Uh, Father Leo was a remarkable man by any standards, and he is still remembered in the Connecticut. This biography documents the life, military service, and religious duty of an atypical early Calabrian uh, immigrant to the United States. Um, that's fascinating, and it, I should mention, too, that it says here in the author bio section that Peter, uh, he's also working currently right now on a multi-volume history of Calabrian, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, is it Calabrian or Calabrian? I think you're Calabrian. It's Calabrian, okay. Um, yeah, so he's working on a multi-volume history of Calabrian American, the hy hyphenated, Calabrian Americans in the U.S. Uh, military during World War One. So fascinating. Um but, uh, you know, I love my Civil War, like, uh, keyhole, you know, miniature histories that really kind of uh, just zoom in on someone that you would otherwise, you know, would be looked over in the mainstream kind of 50,000 feet, you know, narratives that you can get on the Civil War. Um, he's got plenty of illustrations, and there's photos galore in here, uh, original documents, the, the uh, muster roll sheets, which I am I'm familiar with because I, I have a book on. Uh, oh, he he's a he was a, uh, a uh, David Gregg was a federal focus. <laughs> Camera's no longer focusing. There we go. Uh, David Gregg was a cavalryman in the Union Army, and um, uh, I learned about him. He was related to, unfortunately, my ex stepfather. <laughs> I'm not related to him by blood, uh, but um, I always got, I was ever interested in that. I felt I had a connection to a real live, like, general who showed up in many textbooks. I mean, you will, he, he rode alongside Custer. I mean, it was pretty cool stuff, David Gregg, David McMurtry Gregg was his name. But anyway, so I, I used to research this back in the day um, 
and I looked at muster rolls, and so I, I, I am familiar with the uh, the artifacts, the archives that kind of show you where these, you know, uh, give you a, a, a paper trail, as it were. Um, and then we have some, some great photos. Let me get this microphone out of the way here. So thank you to Peter. Um, I've just, again, this has been just the icing on the cake of having a, a booktube channel where I just can talk about history and geek out as much as I want. And you know, I, this is fantastic. So please check out Peter's book. Um, he has more and they are available, I believe on Amazon. And, uh, anyway, I'm looking forward to reading this and, uh, just got it, uh, uh, the other day. So thank you, sir. So again, you know, these were some really, really fun connections that I've been making. And I just want to thank, thanks to all of you again for, for, you know, sending out your stories. And I'm, I'm, as much as that I can do in this little channel, I'm happy to, to, uh, to tell everyone about it. All right. Well, moving on, uh, we, so we have a stack of books here. I have to, to get through here to show you, um, yeah, you know, maybe continuing on this theme, I've got two books here that came um, via a new publishing company in the UK. So all my viewers out there in the UK who love military history, take note. Um, I, w I was another wonderful moment of serendipity where um, people reached out to me. And um, I want to say thank you to Karen. Um, uh, Karen at Lime Tree Press, and it's Karen, K-E-R-R-I-N. Um, and so Lime Tree Press is a brand new um, uh, publishing company. And uh, they are just kind of starting out right now, but they want to branch out into their um, uh, the military, uh, military field, uh, military titles. And they had these two right here, which, you know me, I, I really... <laughs> It's not everyone's cup of tea, but I know for the military, the hardcore, like, detailed military memoirs, you know, uh, readers out there, you kind of geek out on this stuff and you'll love it. So, this is for you. <laughs> Let's see. The first book, it's by the same uh, author, Chris Cox, who fought in Rhodesia. Um, let me, let me, I think I remember the first one I'm supposed to read was Fire Force, and it's supposed to be the manual here. Fire Force, A Trooper's War in the Rhodesian Light Infantry by Chris Cox. So again, a, a brand new imprint from Lime Tree Press. I'll give you, uh, I'll read you a quick, um, and I will list uh, Lime Tree uh, Press, their um, website below in the description box. I will also leave links to um, the Waves of Hope book and also uh, the Roaring Lion by Peter uh, Peter Belmont, Belmont in the description box. So, I, okay, let me just keep going. I'm, I'm getting overwhelmed with <laughs> all the materials I have here. But, uh, okay, so this book, let's see, here we go. This is a personal account of close quarter warfare. Uh, it's a unique, compelling, sometimes brutal account of a young conscript's three years of service in the elite Rhodesian Light Infantry. Cox's work is one of the very few books which adequately describes the horrors of war in Africa. Uh, Fire Force is the best book on the Rhodesian War that I have ever read. And that is um, from the, uh, a book reviewer from the South African, or Southern African Review of Books. Because um, I don't have the actual pub sheet here. But the blurbs, uh, said, like the financial mail says the narrative is raw. It gives the book a veracity so complete that it will transport anyone involved in the ordeal back across the years with the, with the force of a body blow. Rhodesia does at least have its own version of Michael Herr's Vi Vietnam experiences. Um, oh, Rhodesia, Rhodesia does at last have its own version of Michael Herr's Vietnam experiences dispatches. Uh, a sense of regret is what really lingers, that the whole nightmare had to happen at all. The list of names of boys killed or scarred physically and mentally is moving beyond mere words. Wow. 
Um, so as you know, uh, just from my reading of uh, Casemate books and also uh, Colonel Nightingale's um, third person memoir, Just Another Day in Vietnam, um, the, the things they carried, which I thought was a memoir, but turned out to be just fiction, but I think it had some, some elements of uh, truth in there. Um, I, I, I love reading about just the firsthand accounts of uh, men who were in war, and um, I don't know a lot about the Rhodesian, uh, the Rhodesian War, so this is definitely one that I want to uh, take in first. And K Karen at Lime Tree Press told me I should read this one first, and then the second book, which is like a follow-up, a companion. Yes, it makes sense because it's called Survival Course. And that's Rhodesian Denouement and the Roar of Self, also by Chris Cox, obviously. Um, it says we, we get a, a, a big blurb at the top from Peter Benson, um, who's a colonel in the U.S. Army Special Forces Command, Airborne. I nothing held back account. Um, okay, so we do have a description here on the back. It says, in the first half of the book, Cox tells of his time fighting the Rhodesian War as a stick leader in the police anti-terrorist unit. The fighting is brutal and the young men are callous and hardened. Family life is at the bottom of their list of priorities. Tops are killing, drinking, and spending time with their co-warriors. Uh, it is a time of violence and hatred for their enemy. The only people close to them are their colleagues. While this is shocking enough, it is the longer war with himself that horrifies. Cox plunges into failed businesses, drink and drugs, and his desperate fight to forget the horror of his past life and settle into the new land called Zimbabwe, where his enemy is now his equal. His examination of himself, then and now, is one of the bravest stories of war, the cruelty men can inflict on each other, and how difficult it is to come to terms with peace. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to get started on these uh, right away. So that sounds amazing. What a journey. So begin with Fire Force and then the reflection on, you know, the war and its aftermath uh, for a soldier. I mean, how, uh, it's very poignant, and I, I love reading accounts like this. So thank you to Lime Tree Press. I will report back on these, these two titles. I will, uh, again, check out their, uh, their website. These are, uh, I think these are out now. Uh, I'll get that information for you, if not, but uh, let me know if you want any more information on Survival Course and Fire Force, and I will just send me a, send me a note or uh, a DM. So, so yay for new public uh, publishers. I know little publishing houses. I'm, I'm always all about just uh, just uh, let, letting the world know what we've got out there. Uh, because really, where would you find these books? Um, yeah, so in the UK, probably very easy to get these quickly. I actually was able to get these quickly. Um, so I think they do have a distributor here in, in America. So it's not um, necessarily going over the pond. But anyway, doesn't that sound fascinating, you guys? I want to learn about this because... You know me with my rabbit holes. Once I start learning about this uh, war in Rhodesia and who was fighting with whom and against what, I mean, I really don't have a lot of info on this, and I, I, I want to learn. So thank you, Karen. I will be taking a look at these. Okay, now moving on to, it looks like we have a lot of, quite a few university press titles. And you know I love my university press uh, history releases. Let me take a quick sip. Live in a dry state, you know. I mean, there's not a lot of moisture. I didn't mean dry like we can. Well, we don't drink anyway <laughs> here, but. <laughs> I don't know. I say these things and I'm like, whatever. I always assume people assume that I mean something else and I don't. So, okay. So this title, I saw this and I was like really intrigued. This is from Vanderbilt Press. Um, and um, this kind of goes along again lately with my penchant for wanting to read more about Latin American history or South American history as well. I mean, both of them. But, um, and I thought, what a perfect book for, I know we're kind of wrapping up the Black History Month, but check this out, you guys. This is from Vanderbilt, um, 
the press. And this is a black publisher in Imperial Brazil. I'm sorry, at first I thought that was the author's name, but no, this is about Francisco de Paula Brito. Francisco de Paula Brito, a black publisher in Imperial Brazil. And this is by Rodrigo Camargo de Godet. Okay, I am really sorry about that. I, I'm not good with inflections on Spanish and French names, apparently. And this is translated by H. Sabrina Gledhill. So who was Francisco de Paula Brito? Uh, when I read the description, I was really intrigued. So, so this book uh, traces the life of a powerful black printer, bookseller, and publisher in 19th century Rio de Janeiro. Okay, I just read that part. Um, <laughs> as if, okay, so this is a biography of a merchant, printer, bookseller, and publisher of African descent who lived in Rio de Janeiro from his birth in 1809 until his death in 1861, coinciding with a period that was key to the history of Brazil. Between the 1830s and 1850s, Paula Brito became one of the central figures in the cultural and political scene in the imperial capital. Uh, particularly through his work as a publisher. His success was due in part to his ability to forge solid alliances with the empire's ruling elite, among them leading politicians responsible for the unification of the vast Brazilian territory and for the maintenance of slavery and the illegal trafficking of Africans. Uh, consequently, through the books and newspapers he published, Francisco de Paula Brito became part of a much larger project. Wow. Um, so it looks fascinating. There's tons of uh, blurbs on the back here. This this is this is a brand new release from Vanderbilt. Just came out last year. Um, we got sections here. Uh, this is a portrait of this. I've never heard of this gentleman, and I'm intrigued. Sometimes I just like again. I I really like to learn about people you've never heard of in history, um, along with the big you know the big highlighted you know names out there, but. Um, Fantastic. So Van Vanderbilt Press, Francisco de Paula Brito. Look him up. All right. Ooh, and the next book, let's see here. Yes, this is from Northern Illinois University Press, which is not very well known, but it should be. Um, they have a lot of interesting titles, you guys. You should really check out their website um, because... You know, I'm doing the Dostoevsky read-along right now uh, with Codex Cantina, Christy Lewis, and Dostoevsky in Space, and a musical bookworm, and along with a ton of people who are following on our Discord group. Um, we are reading the brother Brothers uh, Karamazov right now, February through March. And uh, just another reminder, we will have our next live stream, actually Thursday night. <laughs> The, at five o'clock, I'm still doing it, even though I'm gonna be a married lady. That didn't take it too personally. I. It wasn't. <laughs> she's funny. She's she's not. She's not uh, insulted, right, honey? You're not uh, offended by that. I told her. I said, you know, I know that's the appointment date that's open, but I have this live stream. I've got to do it. They're depending on me. Mm. And she just says, you know, life with a booktuber, right? Right. Right. No, just. It's totally fine. It's fine. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, we're covering a really big chapter or a set of books in this one. Well, you guys are nuts, but you're having it's a heavy. Time. I think it's great. So, it is great. It should so, be, it should be so nice. Oh, thank you. Well, it, it, it's just an hour, and we'll have all day, and then taking Friday off too. So, nice long weekend of what is bliss. <laughs> Cynical on that. We're have a great time. We are. I'm not cynical. I mean, I just, you know, for me, it's like I already felt like we're, you know, but this is the official. It's the official, and it's good. It's a good thing. I'm very excited. I'm still trying to figure out what to wear on Thursday, so. Whatever you want. Yeah. <sighs> Whatever I want. That's open ended and dangerous. Okay. So, anyway, so I'm, you know, I'm just kind of like steeped in Russian literature right now, and I'm learning a ton about. Uh, uh, just Dostoevsky himself, um, but I want to know more. Um, so I saw this book, and it is a, it, it just came out. You know I, I love reading about 
religion, early Christianity, medieval Christianity, Russia history. This this combines all of these elements. Yep. Oh, actually, okay. So this is Cornell University, but I guess they're kind of related. The North North Illinois University Press and Cornell. I think they're on like an umbrella together. But anyway, when it comes to publishing. Anyway, guys, here's the book. Look at that. Huh? I know I know Una at Codex Cantina is is going to want this book. Uh, this is God, Tsar, and People, The Political Culture of Early Modern Russia by Daniel B. Rowland. Daniel B. Rowland. What is he? Okay. It's Rowland. It should be. Okay. She, she, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Yes, carry on. Okay. <laughs> God's Are and People brings together in one volume essays written over a period of 50 years using a wide variety of evidence, texts, icons, architecture, and rituals to reveal how early modern Russians, 1450 to 1700, imagined the rapidly changing political world. This volume presents a more nuanced picture of Russian political thought during the two centuries before Peter the Great came to power than is typically available. Um, the state was expanding at a dizzying rate, and atop Russia's traditional political structure sat a ruler who supposedly reflected God's will. The problem facing Russians was that actual rul rulers seldom or never exhibited the required perfection. Big surprise. Daniel B. Rowland argues that this contradictory state of ideas was far less autocratic in both theory and practice than modern stereotypes would have us believe. In comparing and contrasting Russian history with that of Western European states, Rowland questions the notion that Russia has always been and always viewed itself as an authoritarian country. Interesting. Um, so this book explores how the Russian state in this period kept its vast lands and diverse subjects united in a common view of a Christian polity, defending its long frontier <coughs> against powerful enemies from the East and the West. Fantastic. Th and yeah, this is part of a, okay, Northern Illinois University Press is an imprint, says here, is an imprint of Cornell University Press. Um, so explains it right there on the back. This looks juicy. Um, Good stuff. Like chapter four title is, Did Muscovite Literary Ideology Place Limits on the Power of the Tsar? Yes, I love stuff like this. You just mentioned it's made with Russia, right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, what of it? My, my attitude towards it too is maybe. Maybe. And then we have a, a cool chapter called, uh, and oh, tons of notes in, uh, at the end of each chapter because they're all essays, but like chapter seven, Moscow. The Third Rome or the New Israel? Ooh. That might help me in my studies. as Because once I finish the Brothers Karamazov, I'm going to have to go sit with it and then go back and reread it at some point and also read books about all of the different themes that are going on. This thing is so dense with meaning and symbolism and religion and who represents what, and it's, it's, so this could be helpful, especially after I read the Grand Inquisitor chapter. That blew me away. All right. Wow. Okay, so this I had a personal interest in. Uh, this goes into, <laughs> you're going to laugh at how I came to this book. Uh, Vin at Revenant Reads might appreciate this, you know, because I am a horror movie aficionado, right? I am a connoisseur of uh, horror and all of its various um, cinematic, um, you know, what do we call it, honey? That's it's 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 appearances. It's uh, you're, you're a horror sommelier. Thank you. I couldn't even think. I'm a horror sommelier. What would I? Do? You know what? Just for that, I'm going to marry you. How about that? No, such a guy. I took out the trash the other day. <laughs> I'm a horror sommelier. Sommel I can't. Okay. Damn it. It's okay. I'm going to take a drink. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fancy word for somebody who likes to drink his own garbage. But. There you go. Yeah. All right. So, you know, there's a movie out there, and I'm a big fan of uh, found footage, if it's done right. 
This one wasn't really found footage, but it's about a topic that's always intrigued me, the Paris catacombs. So it's, I'm sure many of you already know what movie I'm going to say, as above, so below, right? So that movie was kind of cliche and very, I, I, I expected a lot of everything that happened, but there were a couple of weird scenes at the very end that tripped me out and I could see, and then I watched a bunch of documentaries and people who went into the catacombs and looked at the actual footage and it was like, ooh. So then it was like, the actual history about the building of the catacombs is, is quite fascinating, you know, and how parts of the city just, um, when they ran out of room for burying bodies, or they had, no, they were digging up cemeteries and they had to move all the bodies somewhere, right, because the city was growing or whatever, and they tunneled underneath the city. And <laughs> and then they, you know, deteriorated the uh, the. Uh, you know, the foundation so much that parts of the, like, town would collapse in on itself and fall right into the catacombs. Anyway, it's been, it's fascinating. And so I was looking for a book that really, I was doing a hardcore searching, looking for a book out there that wasn't, you know, t sensationalized about, you know, all the urban legends about the Paris catacombs and the people who've gone missing in there. I wanted to know about the history of how they came to be. Well, I was able to find this book also by Cornell University Press. So outstanding, two back-to-back -back books here. This is Making Space for the Dead. Uh, catacombs, cemeteries, and the reimagining of Paris, 1780 uh, to 1830, by Erin Marie Legacy. So uh, as you can see, you know, it's, a, it's a thin little volume, um, but just perfect for my needs here. Um, got some nice illustrations uh it's not a long read uh, let's see without the notes you can read this in 160 pages so uh nice concise little history i'll just read it real quick to you here oh look at my dog's coughing she, she's an attention whore i'm sorry <laughs> no she's not she's a good dog you okay all right, we're at 37 minutes on this video, Goldie. I got to push on. What the heck? So, oh, you know what? Just for that, I'm not going to grab it again. I'm sorry. Okay, the dead of Paris before the French Revolution were most often consigned to mass graveyards that contemporaries described as terrible and terrifying, emitting putrid miasmas that were a threat to both health and dignity. In a book that is at once wonderfully macabre and exceptionally informative, Erin Marie Legacy explores how a new burial culture emerged in Paris from both revolutionary fervor and public health concerns, uh, resulting in the construction of park-like cemeteries on the outskirts of the city and a vast underground ossuary. Listen. Isn't that a great word? Yeah. Making Space for the Dead describes how revolutionaries placed the dead at the center of their Republican project of radical reinvention of French society and envisioned a future where graveyards would do more than safely contain human remains, they would serve to educate and inspire the living. Legacy unearths unearth the unexpectedly lively process by which burial sites were reimagined, built, and used, focusing on three of the most important of these new spaces, the Paris, the Paris catacombs, the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery, and the short-lived Museum of French Monuments. Uh, by situating discussions of death and memory in the nation's broader cultural and political context, as well as highlighting how ordinary Parisians understood and experienced these sites, she shows how the treatment of the dead became central to the reconstruction of Parisian society after the revolution. So, this is just what I was looking for. Um, yeah, I can't wait to, to, to dig into this. No, no pun intended. Oh, God, I cracked myself oh, up. You know she heard me actually. Was that was a genuine laugh at my own yeah, stupid you know, dad joke you're cleverness? Your are just and she, now she, my figure. Yes, my subscriber count will dip. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. Um, but you said yes. You can't stop you now. I didn't mean to. And I said I dig. All right, guys. 39 minutes. Oh, we can do this. All right. Well, some, sometimes you guys like book, long book hauls. I don't know. You can always use the fast forward button. That's all I can say. Okay. So this book, 
Oh, yay. It's from Simon & Schuster. We'll come back to the press, university presses. I, this picture of this guy kills me. But I do like this guy. And I want to, you know, this is on sale. This is coming on March 2nd. So get ready for this, you guys. Civil War uh, fans. Um, historians of abolition and uh, abolitionists, you will love this book. Well, I hope to like it. I can't wait to read it. It's been a while since I've written a book about this guy, but this is Thaddeus Stevens, Civil War Revolutionary Fighter for Racial Justice by Bruce Levine. Uh, and this is out by put out by Simon & Schuster. This is coming out March 2nd. I was able to get a, a copy. All I can say here is why the long, why the sad face? Come on, Thad. Poor guy. He's got a natural pouty lip. Did you see this one? <laughs> is that that great? It's very rude. <laughs> He's all like. He's, he looks like the. Poor guy. He just looks like someone stole his toy or something. What's that African person? You know, Peter, he used to be, he used to be married to Jenny Garr. He was in the Jackie. He's a pretty boy. Pretty. Oh, yeah. And he has a pouty lip. Very cute. Well, this book has been blurbed uh, by everybody. Uh, Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Bookless Kirkus Reviews. Eric Foner has blurbed it. James McPherson has blurbed it. Um, oh, I'm excited. So we all kind of know who Thaddeus Stevens is, right? All my Civil War fans out there. But in case you don't, I'll just read a quick synopsis here. Uh, so Thaddeus Stevens was one of the 19th century's most radical and visionary statesmen. Um, so this new biography uh, put out by Simon & Schuster is uh, by acclaimed historian and best-selling author Bruce Levine. Uh, it's the first major biography of Stevens to be published in over 50 years. That is true. Uh, in charting Stevens' decades-long commitment to, fight, to the fight against slavery, this definitive biography sheds new light on Stevens and his post-war struggle to bring racial justice to America. That'll be fascinating because a lot of times we don't continue to read about um, the struggle for, you know, uh, equal rights and civil rights past, you know, Appomattox, um, you know, past uh, Lincoln's assassination. And um, it's important that we, we look at that period following the Civil War because that's, that's really when things – uh, you know, really didn't go well. Um, let's see here. Long before President Lincoln signed the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation <laughs> I can't, or even endorsed abolitionist views, Thaddeus Stevens was a leader of the Young Republican Party's radical wing, fighting for anti-slavery and anti-racist policies. Frederick Douglass praised him, saying, there was in him the power of conviction, the power of will, the power of knowledge, and the power of conscious ability that made him more potent in Congress and in the country than even the president and cabinet combined. Um, Stevens saw the Civil War as a revolution and relentlessly pursued racial justice, providing an essential model for our own times. Um, and it gives us several examples of, of uh, you know, the radical moves he made. But, you know, it's, it's not a huge... Uh, like double decker uh, door stopper comes in about 244 pages not including notes and stuff but we do have the notes we've got a nice bibliography um, I have already kind of looked through here so I'm looking forward to this because I have been looking for I think the last major biography I think Fawn Brody and I still want to get her version as well. So I do want to read Fawn Brody's version of Thaddeus Stevens, her biography. But uh, this is brand new. And uh, it, again, I was really impressed by the high praise that a lot of our leading Civil War historians and re Reconstruction historians uh, were giving it. So this is going to be topping my TBR here. All right, so Thaddeus Stevens, Simon & Schuster. OK, so now we're going back to University Press Books. Um, yes, we are. This is the University of North Carolina Press. Another fabulous, we're sticking with Civil War themes, in case you haven't caught on to some of the things going on. Ooh, this one's going to be a nice, this is a nice hefty read, baby. Nice tight text here, small type. 
but the topic is fascinating. Brand new book by Andrew F. Lang, A Contest of Civilizations, Exposing the Crisis of American Exceptionalism in the Civil War Era. And this is a beautiful cover. I mean, you guys, look at this. Um, University of North Carolina Press. They just, they just put out outstanding work. Um, and Joan Waugh, oh yes, she's blurbed it. Um, she blurbed it. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she, she blurbed it, and I'm like, No, no, she blurbed it. And she wrote a great uh, little, a slimmer uh, biography on Grant that I really loved. Joan Waugh, she did a great job on Grant. Um, so, yeah, let me give you a quick rundown. Uh, most mid-19th century Americans regarded the United States as an exceptional democratic republic that stood apart from a world seemingly riddled with revolutionary turmoil and aristocratic consolidation. Viewing themselves as distinct from and even superior to other societies, Americans considered their nation an unprecedented experiment in political moderation and constitutional democracy. But as abolitionism in England, economic unrest in Europe, and upheaval in the Caribbean and Latin, and Latin America began to influence domestic affairs, the foundational ideas of national identity also faced new questions. And with the outbreak of civil war, as two rival governments each claimed the mantle of civilized democracy, the United States' claim to unique standing in the community of nations dissolved into crisis. <clears throat> Could the Union chart a distinct course in human affairs when slaveholders, abolitionists, free people of color and enslaved African Americans all possessed irreconcilable definitions of nationhood. Uh, in this sweeping history of political ideas, Andrew F. Lang reappraises the Civil War era as a crisis of American exceptionalism. Through this lens, Lang shows how the intellectual, political, and social ramifications of the war and its meaning rippled through the decades that followed, not only for the nation's own people, but also in the ways the nation sought to redefine its place on the world stage. This is um, a hefty read. This is one I will read a little more slowly. I'm looking right now at the bibliography, and I, I have when I, when I first uh, got it. Wow, holy cow. He, uh, Mr. Lang, has done his research. And I'm really intrigued by the, uh, just the whole premise of this, a contest of civilizations. Because you know, we often hear about, you know, American exceptionalism and, and people have taken offense at um, people who are like, who don't necessarily agree with that for different reasons. Not that they're not patriotic, but, you know, every nation, I think Obama said this, right? Every nation sees themselves as exceptional in some way. Um, I think our experiment has been exceptional um, in good ways and in bad ways, and in contradictory ways, um, but yeah, I, I you know it's it's in light of this last administration, it's kind of rocked some of my assumptions about the country, and, and you know it takes me back to my studies in ancient history uh, as far as like you know empires and you know Rome and. I'm just kind of, you know, I'm looking back and I'm making connections and it's just, you know, it, it, it makes one pause. It does. Um, so I, I was very welcoming when I actually, um, when I saw this come out, uh, I saw it on a Twitter feed and um, I was like, ooh, got to add that to my list. And I want to thank Andrew Lang for reaching out to me. Um, and yes, I will read this, and I will give a review of this. It, this might take me a little bit longer because I want to take my time with this and take some notes. Um, but uh, this is going to be a very, very challenging and very interesting read, especially in light of just where we're at right now with that whole notion of American except exceptionalism. And to hear it like you know, couched in the terms of the Civil War era will be uh, fascinating indeed. All right, so... We've got four books left. Oh my God, we're at 49 minutes. You know what? We're just going to push on. This is going to be an hour video. Some people love the long videos. Some people like to fall asleep to these videos. Looking at you, Roz. <laughs> she's like, she's like, wait, you know, I said that in confidence that it's comforting. 
she she does get points for admitting it and i i like to know that i'm a you know that's a comforting sound as you uh, go off to dreamland um okay the next two books are from uh, new york university press um a couple of very interesting uh new releases here we've got a view from abroad the story of john and abigail adams in europe look at this you guys and i they're offering this book on my history book club as well so this is how i heard about this book um i don't know how many of you uh, out there who are history book members history book club members um i can link their site below if, in case you don't know how to, i'm sure you can find them but um they're offering this book as one of their new releases right now but i requested this from new york university press nice little volume here it, it looked intriguing it kind of takes it from a new angle as far as just you know uh the adamses in europe um, from 1778 to 1788 the founding father and later president john adams lived in europe as a diplomat we all know this right uh, joined by his wife Abigail in 1784, the two shared rich encounters with famous heads of the European royal courts, including the ill-fated King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette, and the staid British monarchs King George III and Queen Charlotte. A View from Abroad takes us on the first full exploration of the Adams' lives abroad. Uh, Jean E. Abrams reveals how the journeys of John and Abigail Adams not only changed the course of their intellectual, political, and cultural development, transforming the couple from provincial sophisti sophisticated world travelers, but most importantly, served to strengthen their loyalty to America. Um, <laughs> that's that's kind of cool. Uh, the, this engaging narrative shines a new light on how the Adamses and their American contemporaries set about supplanting their British origins with a new American identity, illuminating how they grappled with reordering their society as the nation took its place in the international transatlantic world. Uh, oh, this is interesting. After a short time, after just a short time abroad, Abigail maintained that, quote, my heart and soul is more American than ever. We are a family by ourselves, end quote. Uh, the Adams's quest to define what it means to be an American and the answers they discovered in their time abroad resonate with us to this day. So this is a very handsome book indeed. With this jazzy, look at this nice, uh, sometimes I like to take the just, dust jacket off, guys, I'm a weirdo. Look at that, oh, nice bright blue. Oh, I love it. Oh, there's Nabby, Nabby Adams. We all know Nabby. The HBO uh, miniseries on Jan John Adams just was fantastic. I mean, I know it's like, how old is it now, huh? Like 15 yeah, years old, 20? It's, it's still timeless. Uh, Laura Linney was amazing as Abigail. I loved her as Abigail. Yeah, I didn't enjoy seeing her reunited with the guy who played John Adams. What's his name? Paul Giamatta, they had a, a scene where they reunited in Europe after being apart for a long time, and it was really kind of, they had very, they had, they had very awkward, <laughs> it was like, wow, this shouldn't be happening, it's kind of, uh, wait till later, but please, we don't want to watch this. Um, okay, so the next book from New York University Press sounded very intriguing, in the light of I am trying to learn more about Irish, you know, history, and both at in Ireland, but also the Irish experience in America. Um, this sounded really intriguing, and this is America and the Making of an Independent Ireland, a history by Francis M. Carroll. And these are these are new releases. Um, these are brand new offerings from New York University Press. All these books that I'm showing are new. The, in fact, these two, this one right here, just came out this year, within the last week or two. Um, Let's see here. Uh, I know we're running. We're okay. I got two more books, so let me just kind of give you a shorter description. America and the Making of an Independent Ireland centers on the diplomatic relationship between Ireland and the United States from the rising of 1916, and that happened in Ireland, uh, until the early years of Irish independence. 
Francis M. Carroll chronicles how Irish Americans responded to the movement for Irish independence by pressuring the U.S. government to intervene on the side of the Irish nationalists. Carroll's in-depth analysis demonstrates that Irish Americans raised funds after World War I for the, oh, I need you to help me pronounce this name, Dial Iran government? The Dal. The Dal is the Dal. Uh, Okay, Dahl and then Aaron? Yeah. Okay, for the Dahl Aaron government and for war relief. And shaped public opinion in favor of an independent nation. The book illustrates how the U.S. government was the first power to extend diplomatic recognition to Ireland and welcome it into the international community. Um, ultimately, Carroll argues that the existence of the state of Ireland depended on considerable effort and intervention by Amer Irish Americans and the American public at large. So um, it's looking like something I need to read and understand because I am marrying an Irish. This just in. This just in. <laughs> You're still considered an Irish national, right? She's a citizen. She's an Irish citizen until she decides that she wants, if she decides she wants to be an American citizen. Um, it's up to her. You know what I'm saying? All right. Oh, this one. Chicago University Press. Yep, sorry. The University of Chicago Press. You know, I love me some Roman history. Going to break out into song. This is Gladius. The World of the Roman Soldier. Now, I know Vin at Revenant Reads. I know this is right up your alley as well, isn't it, sir? This is by Guy de la Beruyere. At least I know how to, to not pronounce it Guy. In this case, it's Guy, right? Guy de la Bodia. Uh, Gladius, the world of the Roman soldier. And this is a nice, hefty book here. Um, so, uh, okay, we all know about the Roman, ar the Roman army was the greatest fighting machine in the ancient world, right? So I'm just trying to get one more book. Um, and Gladius, Guy de la Bordiere, takes us straight to the heart of what it meant to be a part of the Roman army. Uh, rather than a history of the army itself or a guide to military organization and fighting methods, this book is a ground-level recreation of what it was like to be a soldier in the army that made the empire. Surveying numerous aspects of life in the Roman army between 264 B.C. and 337 C.E., Sorry, they're, BC, they're, they're using BCE and CE here. Okay. Uh, the Latin word, gladius, the Latin word for sword, draws not only on the words of famed Roman historians, but also on those of the soldiers themselves, as recorded in their religious dedications, tombstones, and even private letters and graffiti. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, gladius reveals the everyday life of these soldiers and their families, whether stationed in a bleak frontier garrison in Britain or North Africa, tasked with guarding the emperor in Rome, uh, fighting on foreign battlefields, mutinying over pay, marching in triumph, throwing their weight around on city streets, or enjoying esteem and honorable retirement. That's so cool. Um, you know, I've got so many books on just like, yeah, the history of the Roman army, the, the massive overviews, the um, little like single volumes I'll have on, you know, from Osprey publishing that kind of look at the Roman soldier or the inf infantrymen, uh, the cavalry, what they wore, their weaponry, um, the formations they used. But this, I, this to me, I, I, I don't have a book that actually speaks to this, and this is a brand new book. Um, this just came out last year, 2020. Um, it was first first published in, ah, first published in United Kingdom, so. Uh, I think the UK, you guys have seen this already. So it's, it's, it's gotten over here across the pond from Chicago University Press. So thank you. Um, some of the, the, the chapter headings like, you know, um, leisure and leave, hunting wild boar and other diversions, um, wives and lovers, family life on the frontier, veterans, the emperor's diehards. Um, then you go back earlier into the chapters like, uh, living off the land, the Roman army, and the environment, um, a soldier's life, garrisoning the empire. So these are some really fascinating chapters. Um, 
Oh, this is going to be a good one. I don't know which one to start first. Well, I'm going to be reading many books at once. I can do that, but I, you know, I'm not going to go too crazy. I'll probably have at the most three going, but, um, and then cycle through and then pick up another three. So that's kind of what I, I do. <laughs> so this is Gladius, the world of the uh, Roman sh soldier by Guy de la Baudillere, Chica University of Chicago Press. It's fantastic. Okay, and the last book I have here is is not University Press. This is put out by Knopf. Um, and um, something I, I want to know a little bit more about, it kind of ties into my readings in Russian literature uh, and economics as far as uh, how religion and capitalism play together some, and sometimes don't play together. But this is a brand new um, release. And this just came out this year, I think maybe a, a week or two ago. And this is Religion and the Rise of Capitalism by Benjamin F, sorry, Benjamin M. Friedman. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, and it's a beautiful book I put out by Knopf. Get some nice deck of ledges there. So what appealed to me about this book? Um, it's a reassessment, essentially, of the foundations of uh, modern economics. Um, that explores the profound influence of a little recognized force, religion. Um, let me see here. I'll just say, where, where, do our, where do our ideas about economics, especially our commitment to free markets, come from? Critics of contemporary economics complain that these beliefs among e economists, as well as many ordinary citizens, are a form of religion. Mm. It turns out there is something to this claim but in a deeper, more historically grounded sense. Contrary to the conventional historical view of economics as an entirely secular product of the Enlightenment, and this is what intrigued me when I read the description. I was like, I think I want to read this. Uh, Benjamin M. Friedman demonstrates that religion has exerted a powerful influence from the outset. So we go into beginning in the 18th century, the foundational transition in thinking about what we now call economics was decisively shaped by hotly contended lines of religious thought within the English-speaking Protestant world. Beliefs about God-given human character, about the afterlife, and about the purpose of our existence were all under scrutiny in the world in which Adam Smith and his contemporaries lived. To ignore religious disputes was to refuse participa participation in a vital dimension of politics and intellectual debate. To illustrate this dynamic, Friedman examines the profound impact of theologians such as John Calvin and the colonial preacher Jonathan Edwards on, on the underlying moral assumptions of both European and American societies and the equally powerful effect of the later movement away from those ideas. He also highlights the contributions made to economic thinking by openly religious men uh, such as the American Francis Wayland, a Baptist pastor whose advocacy of free trade stemmed from his economic insight, as well as his, as his religious belief in universal harmony. Whew. All right. Um, so what do you think about that? Oh, we got some good stuff in here. We've got, um, yeah, how does the interplay of, uh, he's saying basically uh, it's not, economic study and um, you know the formulation of capitalist ideas were not done in just a secular you know um, vacuum it uh, and didn't really all just spring from the secular enlightenment but the religion had a big part to play and in this case it sounds like you know Protestant uh, uh, Christianity so fascinating study brand new um, highly blurb as well but that is another, that's one of my recent, uh, among my stack here, of recent arrivals, new, new releases in the mail, in the mailbox. So, you guys, I don't know, I don't know, I think Martina's right, I might have lost some people with this one hour and four minute video. It wasn't her. I feel like since that history tag I did, I... I I just had so much to share with you. And I did. I had some personal news in the beginning that took up about, I don't even know how long, but did. But anyway, guys, so let me know what you think about these books. I'm going to link a bunch of folks below. Thanks to all of you out there. You've really made it a very interesting 
a uh, couple of weeks. It was been it's been great just just seeing what's coming out, the scholarship, and then just the heart that people are putting into their into their research and the stories they're telling of people uh, that we would otherwise never hear about. And I love it, and I'm here to support it 110. percent So with that, Martine and I will say peace out until next time. Uh, the married lady will get back to you next time. The married lady will get back to you next time. Yes, you'll see me. Terrified. Near in headlights. Look. No, I'm fine. I'm fine, guys. All right. Well, thanks for sticking with me. I know it was a long video. We'll talk soon and uh, let me know what you think. Take care. <laughs> Bye.